Hi guys, just before we start the episode today, whatever platform you are listening to this on, whether it be on the podcast, uh, Apple podcast, YouTube, whatever it is, please support it. Please like, subscribe, whatever you can do. You want to reach as many people as possible. So please do that and we'll get right into the episode. Welcome to another episode of the Chronic Comeback Podcast. Today, I am really happy and excited to have on the show Tori Joy Geiger. Uh, So Tori is a congenital heart defect, CHD survivor, and has undergone multiple open heart surgeries and procedures throughout her life. Growing up, she was an avid athlete, Precipitating, precipitating in, in uh, I got that word wrong and I know it's, it's been a long day in uh, volleyball, basketball and track in high school and college. Due to her condition, she has had to overcome so many obstacles and hurdles and it's her story that has given her the strength to truly go after her dreams and live a life now that she's really proud of. She now runs a blog aimed at helping other people dealing with chronic illness, helping them with advice and giving them the tools so that they too can live the life of their dreams. Part of her mission is to have a heart that beats for others, which I love, uh, and to help other uh, others with chronic illness uh, achieve a life of fulfillment and impact. She does this through her 50-50 CHD promise, where 50% of her blogging commissions are donated to CHD organizations, which is amazing. Uh, yeah, I think everything you're doing, uh, using your story for the positive, we were just talking about it before we are coming on. Uh, I love it. I'm excited for, for that to come out in your story, but thank you so much for coming on and uh, sparing some time on, uh, on Thanksgiving. Yes, thanks, Phil. I'm so excited to be chatting. And I just like you were saying, like story is so important to share our stories because there's so much power. And I love that you're doing that with your podcast and glad to be a part. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. So, um, yeah, let's go back to the, the beginning, uh, if we could, in terms of so uh, congenital heart disorder. Is that that's something you're born with, right? Um, yes. So I was born with two heart conditions. So the first one is Epstein's anomaly. And the second one was a coarctation of my aorta. Um, so there are two separate heart conditions. And basically what that means is with Epstein's anomaly, the right side of my heart is enlarged and my like flaps of my valve don't close all the way when they're beating. So they're really inefficient. So blood will like leak back into my atrium. Um, and so it's just not efficient and I didn't have surgery on that when I was a baby, but I did have surgery on my coarctation, which basically meant my, my aortic arch was super narrow. So the blood flow through there to the rest of my body was really bad. And so I had my first open heart surgery when I was four days old. And then I had another procedure when I was two months old and another open heart surgery at seven months old. So that was kind of my beginnings. <laughs> my name is Victoria Foley. I go by Tori, but it means victorious, victory. And I think that that really does describe, especially the beginning of my story. And I think I've carried that through. Um, but really my heart condition didn't get real for me until middle school um, when I was diagnosed with another heart condition <laughs> called supraventricular tachycardia. So yeah, it's a long name. Um, we call it tachycardia, <laughs> but basically what that means is like, I would finish a drill or even be just standing still. And my heart would be racing at 200 beats a minute with me not doing anything. So like you could see it like palpitating out of my chest. And so what happened was basically with that condition, like your heart in the electrical pathway of your heart grew like an extra node. <laughs> and so that's what would cause like a weird rhythm. And so when I was, I was really active growing up doing athletics. And so I started getting these weird rhythms and, um, I went in and got it checked out and sure enough, that's what I had. And that was scary, <laughs> really scary um, at that age. And so I continued with sports, um, but it was something I had to be really careful of um, until I had surgery to fix it. So you had, when, when you had surgery, that was your fourth heart surgery in your life and you were how old? So my fourth, technically I was in seventh grade. So I would have been, I was a young seventh grader. So I think I was 12. When I had that one. (laughs) 
three of those before you were uh, turned one. That's crazy. Um, and so after that, um, like how were things solved then? Like how, how did, how was life after that? Yeah, growing up, I would say I was just had to be really cautious of a lot of things. Um, growing up, they actually thought I wouldn't ever be able to play sports just with my heart condition. Um, a lot of the doctors thought that. And so they were very cautious of me. Um, but I had annual checkups every single year. I still have those. Um, and they were just waiting lots of stress tests um, to see if anything. It was kind of a weird I feel like I grew up in kind of like a waiting zone. They were kind of waiting for something to go wrong. <laughs> it's kind of, I feel like what kind of described my childhood with my heart condition, which I think had some trauma that maybe I carried into as an adult of kind of that feeling of anticipation of something going wrong. Um, and then when something finally did go wrong, that was pretty traumatic um, in middle school and high school. Well, just even just, uh, so I, I I've heard, I've read a lot as well about like uh, a surgery, um, I, just even on like a, like I had my ACL reconstructed and the, uh, I read after that can be, that trauma can last in the body for such a long time. And for you to have undergone three surgeries before you turned one, um, the, that trauma must have, I don't know, you know, how long that, that, that lasts. So even that in itself must have created such a hypervigilant state when you were growing up. Is that, is that fair? Totally. I think I didn't really even realize it until I was older that I had that kind of in the back of my head that I was waiting for something to go wrong or mm -hmm. waiting for my heart to get worse. And I think it was like a fear I lived with that I didn't even, it was just an unconscious kind of feeling. And I think that fueled a lot of, um, my tendencies later on. Like I'm, I am an Enneagram. I think it's a three is the achiever. <laughs> and so, but I have tendencies to really rush through life and try to achieve, achieve, achieve. And I think a lot of that stemmed from when I was little feeling like I don't have a lot of time mm. because I don't know when the next thing is going to happen. And so I think a lot of that kind of was rooted in that trauma, which the doctors is so funny. Like my parents, not funny, but they would tell my parents, like, she won't remember any of this, you know, she's, you know, and my parents are like, there's gotta be some trauma. Cause they, they said like, when I'd cry, it was like a scared cry. Like it wasn't the same. And so I think that trauma just came out later. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, at that age, at those, I'm, I mean, I'm super grateful that I didn't have to go through any of this before my twenties, um, because that at that age, your your biggest worry should be, I mean, you just shouldn't really have a worry at all. Uh, and the mm -hmm. fact that you had your your health as a worry is is and your life as a worry. Uh, did you feel like um, what was the doctor's messaging like to you? And is that something that caused some trauma as well? I would say so. I had excellent doctors, but I would say there was always kind of a well, you're doing great now, but we'll see <laughs> kind of verbiage that was kind of just used because I don't think they wanted to get my hopes up or that kind of thing. And I think um, I get where they're coming from. But at the same time, I think it created a lot of just, I think, fear at an early age, um, a fear of missing out um, on things. And so you're already different than your peers growing up because, you know, when you have a heart condition, things like caffeine when you're little is a no go things like hot tubs, like you wouldn't even think like I couldn't be in hot tubs for very long, just anything that would cause a lot of stress mm -hmm. on my heart were just things I had to avoid. Um, and it was funny because they thought sports would be that stressor, <laughs> but it ended up being one of the most healthy things that has kept me so healthy is my participation in sports wow. through the years. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, what, what happened? You, you mentioned uh, something big happened in, I think you said middle or high school. What, what, what was it that happened? You talked through that. Yeah. So in high school, so I had my first surgery in middle school and then I, the node was gone and then it grew back. <laughs> so then I had to have a second surgery, but before that surgery, I had made varsity basketball. Basketball was kind of my sport um, at the beginning of high school. And I was ambulance from a basketball game and defibrillated three times in the ER um, because my heart was beating so rapidly they couldn't get it to slow down. Um, and so I was ambulanced and the defibrillation actually didn't work um, because 
my heart was just uncontrollable and they were trying to get it so I wouldn't go into cardiac arrest because if I'd gone for much longer it could have gotten pretty really really bad pretty much I would have gone into cardiac arrest is what they've said um but they finally what stopped it was a really heavy antiarrhythmic drug that they fed through the IV that slowly slowed my heart down um but that was a really scary <laughs> experience to be ambulanced in front of all your teammates, you're a freshman in high school, you know, you're trying to prove yourself for, for playing time and things and to be, you know, have that happen. And then your body, I felt so failed by my body uh, at that age. And um, that's when my heart condition really became my own. I feel like in the early years, it was kind of my parents that went through a lot mm. of some of the trauma early on. Um, but that's when it really became my own. <laughs> God, yeah. Uh, I just think when having to go through that, when you're, you're trying so uh, hard to like, it, I know now these days it's like cool to be different, but when you're, yeah. when, when you're younger, you don't want to be different. You want to be exactly no. the same as everyone else. Um, and yeah, oh my God, to, to have to go through that then. And so when you say it was your own, then was that because you were at, you were at an age where, I guess you're, you know, you're spending much of your days without your parents, aren't you? So you, it has to be your own. Um, how did you start to deal with that at that time? And, or, or were you able to deal with it? Yeah, I think at that age, there was a lot of emotion. I think there was a lot of anger that came out and fear that came out of that experience of I had to, I went through therapy, I went through a lot of just talking through what I was going through, because I don't think growing up, I never really did that um, because I just didn't. And I think once I had that traumatic experience and I was like, this is my life and like my life is different because I have a heart condition. I think I, in a way, grew up pretending everything was normal. Um, and I finally realized I'm not normal, but that's okay. Um, when I was at that age. And so I think it took a lot of expressing emotion. It took a lot of mindset work. I think through the lessons I've learned through athletics, I've had incredibly supportive parents that have also helped me see my circumstances in a little bit of a different light. But I think it first started with really expressing some of that emotion of like, why does this have to happen to me? Uh, why can't I be normal? And then moving past that into how can I use this as a way to inspire others who are going through adversity? And I think that's the switch that happened at that age that made all the difference. And it changed high school for me. It changed just life at that point. That's such a mature switch to make. And I feel like um, people could go years uh, without making that switch. I, I, I don't know when it was that I had that switch, but like I, it's that victim and I, it's such an antagonistic um, word yes. to say, but I, I don't care. I, I'm going to say it because we're all doing mm -hmm. gonna do the same thing. And I, I, I know it, um, it triggers some people that word, but it's when you stop seeing yourself as a victim and you start seeing yourself as someone who could actually use that to, uh, to for better for yourself, but also for others. And why... How did you come to that though? I, I don't think I could have done that at such a young age. Like, how did you come to that at such a young age? I think in that time of my life, I realized that I had been living my life as an identity of like sports were my identity. Mm -hmm. And I think my identity at that age was really shooken. And so I had to reevaluate, like, who am I? Like without like, cause sports were on the table at that point, because I had you know, college athletics on my mind. I had, you know, some big dreams. And at that point in my life, those were up in the air. And I kind of had to ask myself, like, who am I without those things? Mm -hmm. And it helped me realize, okay, this is the core of who I am. Like, I'm a friend. I'm empathetic. I'm a hard worker. Doesn't mean I'm only a hard worker on the court. Like, I'm a hard worker just in general. So I think I really had to define that at an early age. And that helped me kind of move forward that, no matter what changes in my life, like if I can't be an athlete, if I can't, you know, do some of the activities that I used to be able to do, that doesn't define who I am, who, what defines who I am is who I am at my core. And that just stays with me. And I think that's what really got me through. And I think the other thing is like, I was defibrillated three times. Like you have to be tough to like, to like undergo that. And so I think 
it gave me a little bit more confidence in myself of like, I'm resilient and I know that I can help others be resilient too. Mm. So to, can you talk, take us through the next part of the, the, the story then? Like what was, yeah. you, so you were in high school uh, going to college, like what, what was going on at that time? Yeah. So freshman year, um, typically I'd played softball, but I took that season and I just, I didn't play. And I, I actually just trained a lot. I got clearance from the doctors after that basketball season to just train. And I took my time. I had to work, I think a lot harder than other people outside of the court, um, just because it took me longer to get into shape. Um, but I actually switched gears and I started really enjoying volleyball more. Um, that was my other kind of main sport. And after that experience with basketball I think it that trauma on the basketball court changed the way I saw basketball and so it wasn't my favorite (laughs) anymore and so I switched gears to volleyball and just started training really hard um, and working on that mindset and that next year my sophomore year was um, uh, we won a state championship in volleyball and I was a starter on the team I earned a starting spot and um, we won a championship that year and I think that fueled my love for the sport and I continued to just put in the work and the hours and through the course of high school we won two more championships so we won three in a row and I think for me it wasn't necessarily you know winning the championships but being willing to step back on a court being willing to go through that trauma (laughs) and use that experience and it it honestly made me a better leader um, Mm -hmm. those years in that sport. Um, I did play basketball, but I think volleyball became my main thing. Um, and I used that trauma as a way to be a leader. Well, because something I, I thought about before and I, I forgot to mention is that you'd been, t- you talked about how you'd, one of the things you were dreading, you were waiting for something to happen. You were playing that waiting game and it actually happened. Um, and that's a, fucking scary thing like the thing you've dreaded the most actually happened but then I guess in a way that can you can either go two ways from that point you can either go away where you're like even more scared or you're yeah. like just like what you said like I was I was defibrillate three times like nothing could stop me um the fact that you went back on the court and you, you know you went at it even though you know you had you know, still had, I guess you still essentially had the, 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 the issue. Um, it must've made you feel so strong after completing that. Yeah. I think it, it felt, it made me not feel like I was a victim to my circumstances anymore. Mm -hmm. I think for me, if I had stopped playing sports, granted, if they had said I had to stop, I would have used my experience probably for other things, but because I got to keep going, I think I got back up and Mm -hmm. it taught me a lot about myself and that scary thing I dreaded wasn't really as scary after I had gone through it and had processed it. I think I learned a lot that some of the things in our fears aren't necessarily as horrible um, as we might think they are. And so I think I learned a lot just about myself in that time um, to just know that I can go through hard things and come out the other side And I came out a better person. I think when I learned that my identity wasn't in sports, it actually made me a better athlete because I wasn't focused on myself. I actually more took the mindset of, you know, make my teammate next to me look better than myself. And that was the approach in that one championships, which was something I hadn't done before when I was quote unquote normal, (laughs) like, and, or wanting to be normal. And so I think that was a change in mindset for me. Um, what has life been like since, since that point? Uh, have you ever had any, any setbacks? Um, like what, has, what has life been since then? Yeah. Um, so I, today I'm a business owner um, and I do that full time as well as my blog. So I have a couple companies I run. And so I think there are times I've been under a lot of stress Mm -hmm. that I, my heart will be very funny. (laughs) I'll get really weird rhythms. And I think I have to be extremely cognizant of rest because if I overdo it, my heart lets me know (laughs) very easily. Um, and so I think stuff like that, um, has been more of the setbacks more recently of just 
I'll get weird rhythms or um, even like hormonal fluctuations and that kind of stuff will throw my heart off. And so I just have to be cognizant of what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And, and you mentioned biz, uh, you uh, run multiple businesses. I think that's amazing. Uh, so I, I was previously in the corporate world and then I've now started my own business. And later on, uh, I wish I'd done it earlier on in my life. But um, yeah, what, what kind of businesses? The fact you're in multiple businesses, that's amazing. What, 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 what kind of businesses? Yeah, so the first one we started, um, my husband and I started a bookkeeping and consulting company. So we do a lot of business books or like bookkeeping for small businesses and do a lot of consulting, whether that's marketing, operations consulting for a lot of small businesses in our area, like realtors um, and real estate companies. And then we also own um, a lot of real estate. So we that's our kind of separate company that we run a lot of rentals and that kind of stuff. And then my third company is my Tori Joy Geiger, um, just blog and platform um, and just releasing books through there and blogs. <laughs> so what, what, what kind of, what kind of books? Yeah. So the book I just released um, is called from vulnerable to victorious, turning your chronic illness into your victory story. So that's my first book that I've released so far, and I want to do more, especially around the chronic illness space. This book in particular is really targeted at chronic illness warriors of how do you turn, you know, this this story that can be traumatic, this adversity into something of impact, your victory story. I think we all have a victory story, and I think there's steps to getting to seeing your story as a victory story. Um, And so in the book, it kind of guides you through the mindset of how to do that. Um, And then there's a prompting at the end of now it's your time. It's your time to share that victory story. So that's that book. And there's lots more coming down the pipeline. So (laughs) I love that. Uh, I I was recently, I I did a course, um, it was like an NLP course. uh, And it was talking about um, like the hero story and in, in every movie book and you know and everyone most well most movies and stuff like there will always be a hero story and, and they they told you to tell like your hero story and even if you were still in the middle of the struggle that you were in which I kind of still am tell it from the perspective as though you know when you've recovered and when you know when you're in, in a better position and I realized that it's such like an in- inspiring story like even like to myself and that it, it, it's so cool to think of yourself as as cheesy as it sounds, the, the hero in your own story. Um, and, that's, and that's essentially what you're saying, right? Like the, you know, the Vic, um, what, sorry, what, it, what is it to Victoria? Sorry. Vulnerable. Yeah, from vulnerable to victorious. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's forcing people to, to in, in the darkest times, which can be the most difficult times, is to look at how their life is going to be so much better as a result. Is, is that what you're? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it kind of goes through the steps of you know. There's a time for you know expressing those emotions, and it's a you need to validate you know what you're feeling. If you're angry, you're angry, and you need to you know don't bottle that down because it's mm-hmm. going to come out <laughs> eventually, and it's going to keep you from living that victorious life. For me, I want to live a victorious life. I want to live a life a victory. And I think you do that by continually getting back up, even when you fall back down and by showing kindness and blessing others, despite your adversity. And so that's kind of the theme in the book is like, how do we live a victorious life and have this victory story? So it, you know, it goes from expressing emotions to developing, you know, a practice of gratitude of how, who do you surround yourself with? Just kind of going through kind of all the kind of different modules, I guess you could say of, creating that kind of life that's victorious and then the kind of cherry on top is then sharing that victory story with others because you have a story I believe for a reason and yeah. someone needs to hear your story um yeah. to help them love that um if so someone listening to this right now like there's there's people coming from all different uh kinds of chronic illness and um some similar some very different um and i think what people tend to get they get stuck in the trap of thinking oh i've been diagnosed with uh i don't know lyme disease or ms or you know that person is talking about something else it's not relevant whereas i don't see that or i think there is a shared mindset that we all need to adopt uh, in order to recover and everything you're saying although we've got completely different things going on it's exactly the same thing and and, and I, I feel that so much 
But for someone who doubts that and is saying, oh, well, no, it's, it's different for me. I'm suffering from chronic fatigue, for example. What would you say to them? Like, how is it, how is it the same for you? Yeah, I would say the same principles are you have to at some point own your story. And I think you have to know how to do that. And so I think even if somebody has a completely different story than you, if you can find somebody else that's owned a story of adversity, I think you can, you can learn from everyone and whether they have a condition like you, that's kind of a mindset I have on just life is be curious. And I think you can learn something from everyone, whether they have the same illness or not. And maybe not everything is relatable, but there will be nuggets that you can totally dive into and practice in your own life that are applicable. What would you say is the first step to someone owning their story? Yeah, I would say it's, it's defining who you are and separate from your chronic illness. So take your chronic illness, you know, out of the picture, take, you know, if you're a model, if you're a sports person, if you're a business owner, that's not your identity. Like, who are you? And, um, and you can ask friends, like, who am I? Like, am I kind? Am I, you know, a really good listener? Am I, you know, different things like that. And really just knowing yourself and it starts with knowing yourself, knowing how you, you act under stress, (laughs) knowing, just knowing yourself really well. I think that's the first step. Yeah. I I think that's amazing advice. I I was, uh, again, on this course that I did recently, it was, um, trying to find out what your top five values are um, and trying to make sure you're living a little bit more in alignment with that. And when you're making a decision about things in your life, like are they in line with your values? And actually I thought it was really interesting because if someone tells me what are my values, I like, I'd probably list about 50 different things, but I've never like ranked them before. And I think when I did that, it did give me more of a sense of identity of like, of who I was. And I think if you can do that as well, I think that can really help someone own their their own identity totally because I think when your life is shaken you can go back to you know this is who I am I know I journaled so much writing is really therapeutic for me and so I journaled just so much of like this is my circumstance but I know this about myself Mm -hmm. and I think that kind of sometimes when I'm really you know at level 10 just like you know having a day (laughs) it, it really helps I think just a reminder of who I am and if I had let myself still think, you know, my identity is wrapped up in this. That's not truly who I am. Mm. And so I think it's given me a lot of confidence too, because I know myself so well. I think something I learned as an athlete is, you know, you're, you're commonly told as an athlete, you know, like pain is gain, like, and you're told like, you know, mental resilience is just pushing through. But I think for me, what I've learned with chronic illness is mental toughness is knowing yourself so well, you know, your limits, you know, but you also know your capabilities. And so I think reframing how you see mental toughness, I think the world might be like, well, like when I had to pull myself out of, you know, drills, oh, she's weak. She can't keep up. But I see that as I knew my body so well that I didn't push it past what it could do and harm myself in the end. And so I think that comes from knowing yourself and it just, that's where it starts. What what do you think uh, the, the lessons that you've taken from like what you've been through, like how has that helped you with uh, the position you're in now with your like businesses and and what you're doing now? Can you, can you, can you see the elements that you've taken and what you're doing now? Totally. I would say with the clients that I work with, I can see how it's helped me as a business owner because I am so heavily invested in other people's stories. I love working with clients and they show me their financial goals their things that they need help with. And I think living with a chronic illness has given me more empathy and it's given me more of a mindset also for helping others. And so when I'm working with clients, it's just given me skills to work with different types of people, people that have different stories and help their goals and their ideas come to life. And I just don't think I would have had the same passion or even just the same kind of ideas I think, um, I think when you live with a chronic illness, you have to naturally be creative (laughs) because you have to kind of problem solve in a different way. And I think that's helped me so much because I've had to be creative in my life of how I do things. And that helps me help clients because I have a different approach than maybe another business owner and my clients love it. And so I think 
that's been a benefit. Do you think, um, do you think there's a tendency of, of people with chronic, well, I'm, I'm relating this back to me. Uh, so like, I think when I was in like the lower parts of like what I was going through, I, I like you was being like an achiever uh, mentality, like always think always got, always actually like you trying to rush through things because I wanted to I want, I, I, and I still do it now unfortunately yeah oh uh, totally me too still working yeah. through it <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I always wanted to get to that next step that next step and so I, and one day I remember saying like I'm gonna have to like lower the bar of what I think I'm gonna be able to do in my life I'm gonna have to be accept I'm gonna have to accept that I'm only gonna earn a certain amount I'm gonna accept that I'm only gonna have a certain job and that then suddenly really affected my mindset and it was a really it was a really uh demotivating thing to think about and I think I went through about a year of being like that and then I was like actually flipped it on its head and I was like no it's it's actually gonna be the other way around I'm gonna end up doing something far better because of what I've been through do you find that you when you maybe come across do you come across people like that that have and actually set their bar too low because they think they're not capable of, uh, yeah, setting it higher. Yeah, totally. I think I've run across a lot of people who are like, I just, I don't think I can do that. And I just, my encouragement to them is like, as cliche as it is, it's baby steps. It's like, you can still have that big vision, but you just have to take off little bites like, and do just what you can to get there. And it might take longer. It might. It might take more hard work. You might like for me, you might be in the gym longer. You might not get as much accomplished during the day, you know, as another person, because, you know, you have to do other things that are a priority, but I think the heart behind it, I think there's favor and there's blessing when you, you are working hard. And I think everybody's level of hard work is different. And so I think if it's not a comparison game. So somebody, as long as you're not comparing yourself to others and you're taking baby steps, you just can do what you can do. Mm. And that's all you can do. Yeah. Have you, have you heard of a, a, a guy called Grant Cardone? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, so have you, he's, he does a book. He's, he's, he released a book called the 10 X rule. Um, and it's all about uh, for those listeners who haven't you know heard of him, he's, He basically, whenever you think about a goal, 10X it. And if it scares the hell out of you, that's good because it will mean that everyone always tries to set a goal that they think they can achieve. Whereas actually Mm -hmm. you try and set a goal that you think you can't achieve. Uh, And then if you hit like, if you don't hit it, but then you've hit like 80% of what it is, then you you just 8X your original goal. Um, Yeah. And and I- I, I, Sorry. So that's how I, I'm a big dreamer. So that's how I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you're, and, and you're, you're running three businesses. You've got multiple uh, rental properties. Like that's like super impressive at, at such a young age. And that is because you've, yeah. And, and I don't think it's, it, it's not dreaming is it? it's thinking big. Um, and I always like, whenever I speak to my business partner, like he's, I'm more of the dreamer of the two. And I think I always try to say, could we do it a little bit bigger? Could we think a little bit uh, bigger? And um, I think it's important to, to do that. And I've set myself some, some goals for this year, which seem unachievable, but I've set them anyway, because I feel like if I don't set those, then I'm not going to do the work in the interim to get there. Yeah. And just think the growth you're going to have, no matter how much you accomplish, if you're shooting for that big goal, the growth is just huge because you have to become that person in order, like that can achieve that. And yeah. so I think it's going to, it's huge. Yeah. Do you, um, in terms of like working with like other people now, do you see them uh, get to the, you know, uh, get to with their goals and then you see them actually then go off and do what you're doing and then kind of almost start to, it's like a, a multiplier effect, right? And they're kind of yeah. helping the people and it starts, is that what you see? That's my goal. And my goal is to really help people kind of unlock kind of those dreams that they have and also that purpose that that's through even their chronic illness and be able to take that and make impact, whether that's in their communities, whether that's impacts different for everybody, but that's my goal is to truly help others be able to find their victory story and then use it for further impact and just continue to multiply it. I love that. I never really thought victory story. I've never heard of that. I think I'm going to steal, I'm going to steal that. Uh, 
I keep saying on I keep saying on air that I'm going to steal stuff, so I probably shouldn't say that because then I'm, I'm it's in public. But uh, I'm going <laughs> to steal it. Um, <laughs> what would you What would you say? Uh, I mean, it's obvious. I think you've you've already talked about it a lot. But like, what what are the ways in which your life is better as a result of your of your condition compared to like had you never grown up with like heart conditions? Yeah, I think. I, even though it's been a lot of trauma, I think I, I have a lot more wisdom for my age. I get that a lot from people and I know I've gone through a lot of hard things, but I think it's, it's opened a lot of doors for me too. I think it's given me a lot of opportunities to speak into people's lives, um, and to help others where I think sometimes when you're younger and you haven't necessarily lived as much life, people can sometimes look down on you or they're like, well, you haven't lived or different things like that. And I think I can use my story of like, I've gone through a lot of things that most people have not gone through ever (laughs) and be able to open doors for more impact at a younger age. Um, I think it's given me, um, especially in the business world, I think I've been able to earn a little bit of a seat at the table is what I guess you could say. Um, I've been able to be a part of investment groups and do things at a young age that I don't really think I would have been able to um, if I hadn't had the experiences because I don't think I'd have the same confidence level or story behind me that kind of backs up who I am. Um, I think my story and what I've done with it, I think my story kind of backs up exactly of what I'm doing and who I am in life, my why in life. And I think, I think people are attracted to people that want to make impact and Mm. use adversity for good. And I think, um, that's, that's been beneficial for me. Yeah. Finding your why. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Also really important. Um, yeah, for the, um, do you have um because we mentioned books and I get the sense that you probably listen to podcasts and read books. Uh okay. <laughs> <laughs> what would be what's your like if you if you had like a biggest uh recommendation to someone right now who maybe doesn't read loads of books, uh, but would be quite an inspiring read or a podcast. Uh don't mention mine because they're already listening to it. Uh, but yeah. uh, what 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 would you what would you uh, recommend? Yeah. Any John Maxwell book is a great book to read. Um, John Maxwell has been a huge author for me. I think one of the biggest game changers for me was uh, Failing Forward. His book, um, it just, for me being an achiever, you know, failure is not something I like to to do. And so I think changing that frame of mind, I think even how you see adversity, that changed my mindset even um, later in life, even more so, it gave me even more of a positive outlook. That has been really good. Atomic Habits is a newer book, but I think anybody needs to read that book because it's so practical to everyone. Um, and then, as far as podcasts, um, I listen to Positive University <laughs> by John Gordon. Um, that's a really good one. He interviews anyone from athletes to um, business owners, just all kind of different walks of life. And, um, that's actually how I found the program I went through to get self-published. Um, and so just things like that, um, he's awesome. Just the message that he shares and the guests, um, that he has on his podcast are great. Um, so those are kind of the main ones I would say, um, that I've read, but I just encourage people to read. I think reading is one of the the best ways to grow. (laughs) Audible has kind of like changed my life when I realized I could like walk and read yeah. a book at the same time. Totally. So, yeah, amazing. Uh, have you read a have you read a book called The Obstacle is the Way? I haven't. It's on my list of things to okay. read. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. it's, it's a similar thing. I I feel like I've read f- falling uh, failing forward. I, I I or maybe I've there's a few books that I've started read listening to and then I jump into something else, which I've got a habit of doing. Um, but, uh, anyway, um, well, look, yeah. uh, in terms of, uh, advice to someone right now, um, who's maybe going through a really tough time, uh, and can't figure a way out at the moment, what would be your advice to them at, at this stage? I think if you're in that stage, I think my biggest advice is start by writing what you're going through down write down those emotions. You might not be a big writer, but I think looking back, writing down your experiences, number one, will be therapeutic to help you. But two, I think you'll understand, like you'll get it from everything that's going on up here down on paper. 
and you can kind of, it helps you kind of sort through it. And I think that's my biggest advice if you're in that stage of your chronic illness is just start writing about it. And it doesn't have to be, you know, fancy writing doesn't have to be a book, but just literally like, I literally am feeling like crap. Like I, and just like literally just putting it all on pages. And I think that's your starting place of where your victory story begins is taking it from here to writing it down, to expressing it in some fashion. Awesome. Such great advice, such, um, yeah, I, I, I'm feeling inspired just, you know, the, the stuff you've talked about, thinking about my own uh, victory story. Uh, and I, I urge anyone listening to this to, to start thinking about their own victory story and how that's going to play out. Um, and if someone wanted to get, so if someone wanted to get access to, you, uh, to your book, is it is it like on, on your website, is it on Amazon or like how? Yeah, it's on Amazon. Um, you can get the ebook, you can get um, the paperback or hardback, and then the audiobook will be coming out in the new year. So if you're not really maybe a big reader, the audiobook with bonus editions of kind of some interviews with both my parents and people that, you know, have other experience with my chronic illness from a different perspective um, will be on there. So that's coming out then. But yeah, you can check it out on Amazon. Awesome. I will definitely be checking that out. I've got a few credits I need to use. So uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be using those. Um, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your story. Um, it's, it's been amazing. And um, I think, yeah, regardless of anyone's age, like the wisdom that you've got at the moment and um, you know, what you've ended up doing in your life is super inspiring to me. And I know it'd be very inspiring to anyone else who's listening to help them kind of dig them out the hole they're in at the moment. So thank you so much for coming on. Yes, thanks for having me. It's been fun. <laughs>